Hi everyone, welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. This is part four in the Compact Desk Pro video series. If you haven't already seen parts one through three, I'd recommend you watch those first as they're all relevant to this part four. In today's video, I'm gonna show you from start to finish how I get this MFM hard drive fully fixed up and fully operational. I'm also gonna show you how I got this keyboard cable looking really good again because it was very stretched out originally. And then finally, we're gonna do a little bit more testing on the video card that's in this machine and this monitor. I found out some interesting stuff there, so don't miss that. All right, let's get right to it. Well, look at that, Seagate, <laughs> it's booting. Hard drive sounds a little worse for wear, not so happy. Good old Seagate, probably a 251 there, or 225. Seek error Han Drive D, let's just fail that. Let's check out this mythical D drive, see if I can even do a directory listing on it. Okay, it's actually doing a directory. So there's just people's files on here, resume and things on this machine. Probably these are WordPerfect documents. This thing was just probably used for word processing. Just for clarity, the C and E drives are the compact flashcard, while the D drive is the Seagate drive. Let's try to copy some files off of it. So what I'm doing right now is I am copying all the files from the Seagate drive, at least what is the C partition on the Seagate drive, onto the E partition. That's the compact flash second partition. And I'm just using Xcopy. I did slash E, so it's gonna copy all the directories. I think we can't read that extra partition that's on the Seagate drive because it uses Seagate Disk Manager. If you remember, that was showing up when it was booting. So I just wanted to copy this, which has all the system files, like that set clock utility, things like that first, and then we'll reboot and try to get the other partition. All right, so this is the config sys and the auto exec on this hard drive. And look here, HD installed on the 20th of March, 1991, invoice number 1405, Able Office Machines. That's a sticker on the front. And then it tries to run some menu off the other second drive. Okay, D is the compact flash card. Is the E partition or that extra partition on the Seagate even showing up at all? There it is. This is the second partition on the Seagate and is now on the G partition, okay. Let's try to copy all this stuff off of here. I'm gonna make a directory desk pro two. This is on the storage partition. Desk pro two, five, copy to desk pro. And let's see what errors out on this old hard drive. All right, this is gonna fail because of those seek errors. I think it's time to run some diagnostics on this hard drive and let it try to fix itself. So when I was in high school in the very early 90s, I worked with my friend Dave at a computer store and we used to fix tons of old computers, stuff from the 80s. And the program that we used on these old hard drives was something called SpinWrite. And what it does is it low level formats an MFM hard drive while the data is on there. It doesn't disrupt the data at all on the drive. Does this thing really work? I'm not sure. Did I have good luck with it back in the day? Absolutely. And I've run this on a bunch of MFM hard drives I have. And ultimately when there are bad sectors, which is what you're hearing with these seek errors on this drive, is it basically marks those unusable so that DOS stops trying to use them. So it does a bunch of diagnostics here, checking system RAM, disk controller, controller RAM, things like that. And then it will do a quick surface scan of the hard drive. It will give us an idea of how bad it is. Oh, here it is doing the quick surface scan of the drive. certainly going really fast. I almost think that it's not reading the hard drive correctly. There's a bad sector there, a few bad sectors. The letter Bs here are marked as bad already in DOS, so those aren't trying to be used. The Cs are correctable in use. The lowercase c is correctable but unused, so it doesn't really matter. And then the U is uncorrectable, but you notice it's in the dots there. That means there's nothing allocated on those particular tracks or sectors. So it finished, although I'm suspect because this is a very small thing and normally this should be full screen. And I'm wondering if it's not seeing the hard drive as the full size. It's just doing some actual checking. Look, it says it can be successfully low level formatted. So press any key to determine optimal interleave. This program, you know, is 
really good for MFM hard drives. It determined that the 4 to 1 interleave is the correct optimum interleave. And look, at you can see the spread of K per second. That just shows how important it is to have the correct interleave. And it varies per system you're using. And with this program, because you're low leveling, you can actually change this. So if you get a drive that's configured wrong, you can actually fix it. Well, since this seems to be acting a little strange in this machine, this hard drive with the spin rate doesn't seem to be seeing the whole drive. I'm not totally sure. I'm going to take this drive out and I'm going to put it in a different computer. Oh, and it's a ST251-1, kind of what I thought it was, which is a 40 meg hard drive. And just so you know, these MFM hard drives auto park when you turn them off. The 225 to 20 meg version, that doesn't. But the 40 megs and the bigger versions of this particular Seagate drive, ooh, this is a warm drive. These do auto park. When you turn them off, you hear the and that's that's the head. It's using the, the spinning of the motor to actually generate some electricity. And then it moves the stepper head into the park position. So this is my tester junker crappy thingy machine. I don't know what to call this thing. It's an old 386SX25 motherboard I had that a uh, battery leaked all over it, completely wrecked it, and yet somehow it still works. I had it in my parts bin because I assumed it was bad, and one day I fished it out and tested it out, and it actually worked. So I, I put it together in this rather junky case, and it all doesn't fit, and it's just a rather junky machine, but it's perfect because it's a 3D6, so it's relatively fast, and I leave the MFM controller in here for this exact reason when I need to run spin right on drives like this and recover data, I can do it with this. It's got an XT IDE card in there as well. So it's great for copying files. It's good to operate these Seagate drives facing up like this. And that's what I'm gonna do with this. This machine currently has an EGA card in it. So it's configured for CGA. Let's turn it on and it should show up on my Commodore 1084. Let's put the spin right disc in here. So we gotta boot that. Yep, there it is. Oh, we're gonna have to go in the BIOS though. Right, and configure this for a 40 meg hard drive. That's the benefit. In an XT, the hard drive's parameters are configured on the hard drive controller card. It has a BIOS there. They're hard coded. So it's not flexible like on a 286 or higher. And in here, we can go in here and just simply adjust the C drive type to whatever we want. I think this is it, type 40. 820 cylinders says six heads, 17 tracks per sector, 41 megabytes. It's certainly not sounding happy right now. So the BIOS is trying to scan the hard drive and it's making weird noises. Just because it said C drive error at the BIOS doesn't mean that it's totally dead. So we're gonna boot anyways and we're gonna run spin right and hopefully it's gonna be able to see the hard drive without issue. Okay, so spin right didn't work. I didn't show that on camera, but it just basically said it couldn't find a hard drive that worked. Well, it's the next day and I've basically had no luck with this. I've switched to Speed Store, which is another MFM hard drive formatting diagnostic utility. And this drive is definitely degrading. So all seek tests pass. So the seeking mechanism on this drive is not the problem. But with the read test, it will get tons and tons of read errors. And it's not like every track and sector is bad. Essentially it's spread across all the different heads and this screen will just completely fill up with read errors so it's quite possible that these read errors will go away if I re-low level format this hard drive because it basically rewrites the entire disk surface with a new signal. And this could just be degradation of the magnetic flux on the disk. Unfortunately, this would be a destructive process because SpinWrite, which does that, doesn't work if there's no compatible DOS file system that's able to be read off this disk. And at this point now, at least on this machine, it can't even read anything DOS wise on this drive. So all I have the option of doing is using speed store to read low level the hard drive and then hopefully these errors will go away. Since the drive seemed to be very dead, I wanted to test it one last time in the compact to see if it even worked at all anymore. I have it back in the original machine here. Let's see if this can boot anymore in this machine. Yeah, it's booting up still on this machine. So the other computer can't read it whatsoever. And yet this one can. So when I get an old computer, I wanna see if there's anything program-wise that's maybe cool or lost, some old DOS utility, stuff like that. 
but definitely what I see on this D drive on this machine seems to be legal related files, as in this was probably used in a law office. So I'm not too concerned that I'm about to low level this hard drive and lose everything. So it's time to low level this hard drive and just call it quits. And hopefully I can get this thing working again. Well, back on the 36SX, it's time to go back into Speed Store and we're going to low level this drive. So in Speed Store, we go to Manual Setup, we go to Initialize, we use Standard Init, which is a standard low level, and it's gonna destroy all data on the drive, that's fine. That's, there are some bad defects on the top here, but we're gonna leave those off and we'll scan for those later. It's gonna ask us for the default interleave. We're gonna use four, which is what was in use on this drive on the other computer, seems to be a good speed. And here we go, initialize. So now it's written everything to the drive and it's currently scanning the media and any defects that are found will be marked as defects in the table on the drive. And interesting is head two, 22, 23, and 24 is actually what's written on the top of the drive, although it's 21, 22, 23, and 24. So oddly is track 21 didn't show up in the scan, but so far these match exactly what's on the sticker, except for that single one. And you notice when I did the scan earlier, there were so many bad tracks and sectors. And look, we're already up to 117, and so far just these three. And look at that, I scanned the entire drive and just found three bad tracks, that's it. So it's asking if I wanna write this to the Brad track table, which I will say yes, and initialization is complete. Amazing, the format completed without any issues. So booted into DOS now, C drive should be visible. Wow, there it is. So let's sys the C drive. Should copy DOS 6.22 over to the 40 meg drive. System transferred, take the disk out, control alt delete, and it booted right off the hard drive without any problem. Wow, and 42 megs free. All right, we're back to spin right. So now this drive has a properly working DOS format file system on the entire drive. Spin right will have no trouble with actually being able to read the entire drive. Now, remember I said the interleave of four was the optimum for that original Desk Pro machine at 130K per second. But notice on this machine, which is a 386 with a 16-bit MFM controller, we get up to 522K a second average with a one-to-one -one interleaf. But these speeds are just not possible because the machine is not fast enough on the other one. So I'm currently gonna leave it at four to one, which is the optimum for that machine. It's now doing the scanning process and this is just gonna take a very long time. So far it's done 10 out of 4,900, 0% done, and this will run for hours and hours and hours. But it does a thorough pattern testing of every single sector on the drive. If it finds any that are marginal that just don't test good anymore, it will mark those as bad in DOS so that DOS won't use those anymore. Well, would you look at that? SpinWrite completed the analysis of this ST251 drive, and overall, it looks fantastic. So I think it's time to put this back into the Desk Pro and see how it works with DOS 6.22 on it. All right, let's slide this hard drive back into the chassis here. Even though the hard drive was partitioned and bootable on the other machine, the compact was not able to boot or even see the drive at all. So I'm trying to get the MFM hard drive working. I have the compact flash card removed from the machine. If I tie to run F disk in DOS, it detects it as like 614 cylinders, which I think is typical of a 20 meg hard drive, but I can't actually get it to partition. So I set out to try to find more information on what exactly is this controller. It says at the top here, JCC made in China, a little QA sticker, but all of the ICs on here, well, these large ones at least, are Western digital branded chips. I did some image searching on Google and I found other people selling this exact same card and one's very similar to it. So it seems like there were a lot of clone MFM controller cards that looked just like this or very similar. And after quite a bit of searching, it seems like this card was actually a clone of Western Digital's own WDXT Gen card. So I was able to find the instruction manual for the Gen card, which I think will help us get this hard drive working again. So these are from the printed instructions. And interesting is right off here it says, 
the WDXT Gen controller is easy to install primary controller with no confusing jumpers that you need to set. Simply order the feature set number which corresponds to your drive you wish to install. Well, here are the different feature numbers, right? F300, F320. Down at the bottom, here's F340, and there's the Seagate 251. That's the 40 meg drive. Older MFM controller cards on the XT had a bunch of configuration jumpers that you set to control the type of drive you were going to be using it with. And some of the really early ones only really supported 20 and 30 meg drives and didn't even support the 42 meg drive like we have here. So remember when we were looking at F-Disk originally, it made it seem like there were two 20 meg hard drives, which seemed a little odd to me. But if you look right here, it says F300 allows dynamic low-level formatting, bad track formatting, and virtual drive splitting. And F300 is one of the feature sets right here that normally shows up as a 21 megabyte. But it seems like the one with the asterisk there is the one that allows these features. And perhaps originally when they configured this drive, they used the virtual drive splitting to split it up into two virtual 20 meg drives. Now, if that's the case, we can try to configure this as a single 42 meg drive so we can see the whole thing and we can just partition it in DOS. On the next page of the instructions, this right here is the relevant thing we need to do. We're gonna use the built-in BIOS format utility, which seems to allow us to configure the drive. Controllers back in, drives all connected back up, and I have Compact DOS 4.01, which is MS-DOS, just a rebranded, on this disk here with the debug command, which you need to initiate the format. Let's power on the machine. And I have the compact flashcard removed from the machine just to simplify any potential issues. A for booting off the A drive. There's an interesting side note about compact DOS 4.01. So when this boots up, it actually puts the computer into the fast CPU mode. So regular MS-DOS ends up in slow mode, but without running my fast.com, this, this is fast. All right, I'm following the paper here. So it looks like we start with debug. G equals C800 colon five. So I'm gonna follow the steps step by step in the documentation. Now it shows a screenshot and it says, current drive is C, select new driver, push enter. It's exactly what it says here. We're gonna hit enter. Current interleave is three, select new interleave or return for current. I'm gonna put in an interleave of four since that's what Spinrite said was best for this computer. Are we dynamically configuring the drive? Yes, we are. And here it wants me to enter all this information, which I'm going to take off this table here. And we're going to use the disk characteristics in this format. So total number of cylinders on the chart is 820. Number of heads, 6. The next one is starting reduced right cylinder, which according to the chart is none. So I guess I'll put 000. PPP, right pre-comp, 410. All right, next is max correctable error burst, defaults of 11 bits. We're gonna keep it at 11. And then the next one is CCB, which is the step rate select. Now, according to the chart here, step rate should be 18 microseconds. And on another page of the instructions, it has a little chart here where it shows 18 microseconds per step is seven. So we're gonna put seven. We're gonna hit enter. Are we virtually configuring the drive? According to the instructions, it says, enter no if no virtual configuration. Current version of DOS allows no more than 32 megabytes per drive. Therefore, a 40 megabyte drive may be divided into two virtual drives using the virtual option. Well, we're not gonna do that because we're gonna use DOS 4.01 to FDIS this and that supports over 32 megabytes. So no, press yes to begin formatting drive. Why? And we can hear the drive is now formatting. So it all really seems like this dynamic configuration is sort of the equivalent of the heads and cylinders in the 3D6 and 2D6 BIOSes. My hypothesis is it's actually taking these settings you type here and saving them onto the start of the hard drive. So when you turn the computer on, it just reads that information immediately and then dynamically configures the controller for the appropriate heads and cylinders and size. This is probably why when I low leveled this in my other computer and I put it in here, it didn't even know what to do with it because it no longer saw that configuration information written on the drive. It finished formatting. Do we want to enter the bad tracks? I'm going to say yes. And the format is CCC for the track, cylinder number, and then head. And I remember the, it was 21, two, 22, two, 23, two, and 24, two. This is what was on the label on the top of the hard drive. No more. Format successful, all right. Let's see if we can F-disk this now. F-disk. 
That's good. It seems to see the hard drive. So we'll create primary partition. Maximum size, yes. Let's do four to look at what's on the disk. 41 megabytes. That's looking good. And I exit this, it's going to ask to reboot. All right, let's format the hard drive. Format C colon slash S. So it finished formatting, and you might have noticed in the high speed that it said recovering allocation thing, so there were some errors on the drive. Then we lost about 40K to the bad sectors, but I'm assuming those are those bad tracks that were marked in the low level to utility. I think DOS still tries to format those anyways. I'm copying everything off the A drive, which is the boot disk, onto the C directory, the C drive in a DOS folder, and then we'll reboot, and hopefully it boots up on the C drive without issue. I'm gonna power cycle the computer here and we're gonna just see if it boots correctly off the C drive now. The compact flash card is still removed, so it should boot off the MFM hard drive. It's booting, I hear it doing it. Hey, look at that. Let's see what check disk says about the C drive. Nice. So rebooting with the compact flash card and the MFM hard drive is showing up as the D drive now. So this is perfect. I can run some scans of the drive using scan disk and other tools to see if this drive is actually error free like it says it is. Well, would you look at that? Scan disk found no problems on this disk. I'm here to run spin right, which I have on the B drive. Ooh, something else interesting. Remember I used the interleave of four? Look at the data rate right now. It's so slow. So there we have it. The optimum interleaf is five to one on this machine with about 100K per second. And I picked four to one based on, I think when I ran this last time on this machine, but maybe it was also from the 386. And that's uh, getting only about 30K per second. So we're definitely gonna be changing it to five to one, which this program can do. I'm gonna run the extremely thorough pattern testing, which is gonna run for many, many, many hours. If you recall, when I first ran spin right on this machine, it was only showing a little window about this big where I quickly scanned the hard drive. And this is more correct. This is the entire capacity of the drive. Spin right thorough testing can take a few days on a drive this size. So it's the next morning and I want to give an update on the progress. Checking the status screen, we were at 38%. And interesting is all these dots mean that nothing has been found, no bad sectors. In fact, these up arrows here, that says sector now okay. Those are those bad sectors I marked out using the track map on the drive, and now they're showing up as fine. On, over here on the screen is the time monitor. Now you can ignore these timestamps because I didn't set the clock, but this has been running for nine hours and 47 minutes, and it still has 15 hours to go. Here's the detailed technical log, and this is what it was finding. A sector that was flagged bad has passed all tests flawlessly on physical sector 17 of surface 2, cylinder 24. This is DOS sector blah, blah, blah. This sector is now being returned to full use in the system. But here's one where the sector did not come good. Pattern testing confirms a bad sector that was already marked bad, and this is 21 and head 2. So interesting is that only one sector for each of these tracks was actually bad. It was sector four on 21 through 24. Many hours later, it's finally finished. So compared to when we last checked in, it found one additional bad sector on the entire drive. And in a detailed technical log, this is what it says. A surface defect has been detected, two exclamation points. Physical sector 10, surface four, cylinder 755, it says that the sector is not in use and it is marked bad, so DOS won't try to write to it in the future. So in the end, even though 32K were returned to use because of those sectors that tested good, two additional kilobytes were taken out of use, leaving us with a total of about 10K marked bad in the FAT, or file allocation table. I've removed both floppy disks from the machine, and let's reboot it with Control-Alt-Delete. And it boots up and seems to be working perfectly now. I ended up reformatting the drive with DOS 6.22 and copying the entire contents of the CF card to it. The drive is now working flawlessly. 
So the compact's looking great. Obviously, we'll attack the yellow plastics at a future date. But what lets this thing down right now is this keyboard cable that's very stretched out and looking pretty ugly. When I first showed the keyboard cable, I had some suggestions on how to fix this thing. And what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to use this dowel and I'm going to wrap the keyboard cable around it and then heat it up. What's this, you ask? This is a regular micro USB cable, one that was straight originally. I wanted to test the process of turning it curly. What I did is I wrapped it around this dowel, heated it up with the heat gun, and then I just put it under some water while it was still wrapped around the dowel. And look, we got a stretchy USB cable. Although, I gotta say, it doesn't seem to hold its shape very well. Look, we stretched it and it's not exactly going back. But perhaps that was because I didn't heat it up long enough or cool it for long enough. So I'm gonna do a little bit more research to see what the optimum temperature is. So here's what I've come up with. I have a dowel with the USB cord wrapped very tightly. I use some zip ties to kind of hold it tight on each end. And then I zip tied it to this larger dowel so I can just drop this into the water here while this water is boiling. We have an induction cooktop should allow me to regulate the temperature properly. Let's get this started. Sorry for the fan noise, but the induction cooktop has a loud fan in it. It runs at 1800 watts, so it's gonna boil this water quite quickly. I dropped a thermocouple into the water, so we're checking the temperature we're at 73 degrees centigrade. Okay, it's noisy in here. This thing has been in here for maybe about 10 minutes. I think I'm just gonna take it out and then I'll leave it to air dry and air cool. While the other cable is drying, I decided to take the keyboard apart so I could maybe disconnect the cable for safer recoiling and check it out. Here's the inside of the keyboard. So clearly this is a slider design. It is not the foam and foil capacitive like the compact portable. And then here is the PCB and it's definitely a rubber dome keyboard. It's a little dirty, so I will give this a little bit of a clean. And unfortunately, the cable is firmly attached with no connector. So thanks for nothing, Compaq. All right, so I let this cool down and then I doused it in some cold water just to really chill it. Let's see if this thing is actually coiled. Well, good sign, as soon as I cut these off, it didn't immediately try to <laughs> loosen itself. Originally, when I was putting this on, I was wrapping it around and as soon as you let go, it would kind of uncoil itself. Oh yeah, this is pretty tight. In fact, it's not even easy to get this off. <laughs> There we go. So it looks pretty good right there. As it was before, it looked good initially, but as soon as I stretched it, it didn't maintain its shape. It didn't stay tightly coiled. It loosened up, so. Let's just try again, stretch. Yeah, that's not great. It's not staying super tightly coiled. I mean, it's definitely a coiled cable now. It's possible the plastic sheeting on the keyboard cable is more suitable for coiling than whatever this cable was made out of originally. So the compact keyboard cable is wrapped very tightly around this dowel. I took a lot of care to just make sure it was as tight as possible. And then I used two strong zip ties on each end to really tighten it down so that it will stay very tightly coiled. And because I can't remove this from the keyboard, I think I'm gonna try a different tactic and I'm gonna use a heat gun on this. It'll be just too difficult to boil this without risking getting water on the keyboard in the PCB. So we're gonna be doing the heat gun on this. I'll keep the keyboard covered like this with this cloth just to keep the heat off the keyboard. Here's my very noisy and crappy Harbor Freight heat gun. I'm gonna keep it on 570 degrees Fahrenheit on high, and then I'm just gonna keep it moving. I'm gonna take it away from the table here so it's in free air. And I'm gonna make sure to get all sides of the cord. So I'm gonna keep it lifted like this, and I will just start going at it. All right, sorry for the noise. The heat gun is cooling down. I'm just letting this cool. I'm not letting it rest on the table. That way it's not gonna maybe get a flat spot. Although it's really not that hot. It's pretty warm though. We'll see if this worked at all. And you know what? Maybe I'll have to do a couple cycles of this. So it's been a few hours. The cord has completely cooled off. It's nice and cool. And I'm gonna cut the zip ties and we're gonna see if this even holds its shape. Well, it's not immediately trying to uncoil. I'm really struggling to get this dowel out. 
Well, that looks a hell of a lot better than it did, that's for sure. Look at that. Don't know if this is as good as it was when it was new, but it's certainly far better than it was. I'm not gonna pull on it because I'm afraid like this cord when I do this, it doesn't really go back, but that's okay. I just wanted this to look a little less crappy. So it's, it's a lot tighter now than it was. I'd call this result a massive success. I'm very pleased with how that turned out. One last thing before we end this video. I did testing in part three to see if the video output coming from this computer with that compact video card looked like normal CGA, and it did. So I wanted to see if hooking up a color monitor to that internal card would actually produce color. And as you see here, it's working fine. I hooked this particular monitor up to this computer because it pretty much supports every type of video standard that there was back in the old days. If there was gonna be a monitor that supported the higher resolution that this card can output, in color, it was gonna be this monitor. This natively supports the monochrome video standard from the original IBM MDA cards. So it seemed like this high resolution mode coming out of this computer was a sort of hybrid of that. Now pushing the key combination to switch from regular CGA, which is what we're in here, to the high resolution mode gives us this, just a black screen. Judging by the sound of the monitor, it sounds like it's still synchronizing to the video signal perfectly, but we're getting no image. And I think there's a reason for that. The original MDA signal used that elusive pin seven on the DB9 to send the video signal. It still used pin six for intensity, but the RGB wires are unconnected. And I think what's happening with this monitor is as soon as it synchronizes to an MDA type signal, it will ignore the RGB input and look for that pin seven video signal, which of course, as we determined on this card, does not exist. So it's unlikely I'll ever get a high resolution color picture out of this computer on this monitor. I just don't think this monitor supports it, not without some hacking at least. I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say that the fact that this computer is sending a standard color CGA signal out without changing any settings internally means that that compact monitor likely works with any CGA signal and it will output 16 shades of gray or amber in this case. So it obviously has some circuitry inside the monitor that converts from the digital TTL RGB into an analog grayscale signal. And we can quickly test that by connecting that monitor to another CGA PC to see what happens. The compact monitor is reconnected to the power on the compact and also the video signal, which is why we're seeing the same color gradient we had before. And I have my Tandy 1000 EX sitting right here on the chair next to the computer. And because the compact monitor has a very short DB9 cable, I have attached a DB9 extension cord to the video output on the Tandy. So let's plug the Tandy monitor into this DB9 extension and let's turn on the Tandy. Oh, look at that. And there we have it, 16 shades of amber from the Tandy 1000 to the compact monitor. The only real difference is because the Tandy uses a font that uses one extra pixel per line. It just makes the image a little taller and there's no controls on the back of this monitor to shrink this down. So we're getting a picture that's closer to the top and bottom than we had on the compact. Well, there we have it. This monitor works on other computers besides the compact. It's pretty advanced if you ask me. This is kind of an early multi-sync monitor supporting both the CJ and the MDA type resolutions, but it converts the 16 color TTL to 16 shades of gray. How neat is that? And I noticed one thing on plugging the monitor, there is no pin seven on the monitor connector whatsoever. So that concludes right there that this can't use monochrome because that uses pin seven. Well, that's it for the Compact Desk Pro series. It's been a pretty long road to get to this point, but I think it was worth it. Hopefully you found some interesting things in the four parts we've seen so far. I will get back to a part five eventually where we do the retro write on this thing, but otherwise I'm really happy with how this machine turned out. It looks good, it works well, and a huge thank you to everyone who helped me out with programs and tips and techniques for getting this thing fully operational. I had a lot of fun on this project testing out new techniques, things I had never done before, which is kind of amazing because I've been using PCs all the way back into the 80s. So I'm still intrigued that even in 2019, I'm still finding out new stuff about these computers. Anyway, I hope you found stuff in this series interesting. If you did, I'd appreciate a thumbs up. But of course, if you didn't, you know what to do. You can hit the thumbs down button. Subscribe for more videos. There'll be lots more coming in the future. Put your comments and your suggestions down in the comments section below. And thank you very much for watching. 
Goodbye.